So I'm very excited to welcome our new guest here today, Musimbi Kanyoro. Originally from Kenya, Musimbi has been working on human rights, but especially women's rights, gender equality, and female empowerment for almost four decades. He was, she was the first woman from Africa to serve as Secretary General at the Young Women's Christian Association from 2011 to 2019. She was CEO and president of the Global Fund for Women, a nonprofit organization that funds initiatives in exactly this field, women's rights. And now she's a board member and global advisor for the Target Gender Equality Initiative of the UN Global Compact that works on getting women into the boardrooms, into decision-making roles, and works at the intersection of the public sector and the private sector. She's worked with Mary Robinson, Hillary Clinton, big names across the world on these issues. She's a, an experienced ally for these topics that we're trying to focus on today, and we're quite excited to have her today. Thank you very much, Klaus. I have been working for many years, and so when I hear Superwoman, I, my many pictures come to mind. It's sometimes the woman that I meet in an office who has a high position, and while she's doing her office work, she's thinking of her children in the home. She's thinking of the caretaking that of her old parents. She's thinking of the shopping. She's thinking of a million other things. And sometimes she has to dash out of the office and go and pay attention to these care needs that women always have to handle. Meaning here for me, I'm thinking of those women that handle so much that nobody calls them superwoman, but they are my superwomen because they are the ones that really know what it means to multitask and to multitask in difficult, in difficult times. But uh, Klaus, I want to be able to say that the film Superwoman, which probably many of the audience will have seen, does show that a superwoman is that one who gets very hard things done. And uh, I would want to debate, to debate that because uh, that depends on where, when we talk in the, in the business world about wanting to have women do um, the same things, be treated equally like men. Um, we are also trying to say, who are these supermen? What have they been doing? And the balance, the balance of debating this issue is so essential. So when we look back 10 years, you started um, 10 years ago in 2011, I, I mentioned it in the intro, you started as CEO and president of the Global Fund for Women, an initiative, a nonprofit organization that funds women's rights initiatives. If you look back at the last 10 years, looking at gender equality, at women's rights, at female empowerment, are you happy with the progress we've made? Are you depressed when you get up in the morning? What's your, what's your emotions like? What's your feeling when you look at the past decade? Klaus, I've never had opportunity to be depressed because of things going badly. Because for me, I think the glass is always half full. Um, there is something that is happening that is good progress, and there's plenty more to be worked on. So when I look at 10 years and I look at the work that has been done in regards to gender justice and gender equality um, for men and women all over the world, I think we made a great progress. Because now if you go into every, any field that you can think of, you will find some women that are prepared to be able to do that task, to, to, to have that invention. And so I'm more concentrated on not are there women that can do good things or do we have enough women to do good things, but rather where are these spaces that are open and who is letting the women come to the table, but also giving them opportunity to contribute their best of who they are as human beings and what can they bring to the table that also makes that table even better because a new group of people with the new thinking, with the new upbringing, with the new responsibilities have come to the table. So I think we made a progress right now. I, I think that um, we are working on sustainable development goals. And uh, since I work in the context, and I'm here in the context of uh, the UN Global Compact, uh, we're seeing a, a great progress when we work with corporate companies and actually are able to share the available research from everywhere that shows that when men and women work together, there's a better progress for the company. Um, there's a better progress for running a school. There's a, a better progress for running a social movement that it's all over, it's not just in one area. Yes, I was a CEO of, uh, not only for 10 years, but I was a CEO also in Switzerland before moving to be a CEO in the USA. And um, in my role as a CEO in various places and interaction 
with other leaders of the world, I have known that when you have a personnel staff that is mixed, that brings together a variety of, of, of diversities, you actually feel elevated as the CEO. And one time I do remember that Forbes did recognize my work. Um, uh, so I'm a Forbes recognee, but it was not my work. It was the work of working with such a diverse group of, of women and men in order to bring the changes that we thrived to bring. Now we've looked back and you said that you don't have time to, to be depressed. You need to stay optimistic. If you look ahead 10 years, if you look to 2031, what's a nut you would like to crack or see cracked? What's a problem you would like to see solved when we talk about the topics you've been working on for so long? What's sort of bugs you that it's still not happening or hasn't, hasn't been solved? No, when I look 10 years from now, my focus is on women like a, like uh, uh, um, uh, I have to mention one in which whom everybody will know, the Grand Swedish young activists on climate change. You see, there are so many of those kind of women. And what and now I saw as I watched COP29, there were so many young people, both women and men. So when I look forward, I don't say there's a problem that has not been solved. But what I say is that there are people who believe and bear the same values that I have borne over this time. And they are going to continue either to be a bee in the bonnet of people who should be acting, or they themselves will be part of the leadership of the world that we are creating. And they are going to be change makers and some change will come. Of course, I'm aware that this is being optimistic alone is not enough. Uh, so here, here are three things that I, I focus on. I feel like we are getting a better world of getting a lot of data on which we can base um, um, decisions that are good decisions, whether we need data on leadership and inclusion at various levels, data on climate change, data on development, data on how you actually pass and find people to do the best way, data on diseases, etc. So I'm optimistic about data, that we are able to collect better data. But I'm also optimistic in the fact that we don't just collect data. We're beginning to realize that we need to respect the people uh, from whom we collect the data from, uh, whether you're in the industrial area or in the social area, and you can't just go there and count people. We also have realized clearly that it's not just statistics that matter, but it's also the, the, the stories of people, the realities of sin. I'm optimistic about that. I'm optimistic about the way that we are able to use technology in ways that we didn't know before. And I think, I think that post-COVID has also inspired new innovations that we will see come not only from the ability to create new medications for diseases that come that impact on all our lives, um, but also for technologies to get these um, um, medications that we want into the places where they, they are. I'm very optimistic about that. I'm very, being a woman from the South, I'm an African woman, I'm very optimistic that um, our voices, which for a long time often did not get anywhere, uh, but now we can not only knock on the, on the windows and try to get there, sometimes we are at the tables. And because we bring very spectacular and unique experience of having lived at the margins, I am really optimistic that we can influence what happens at the center as well. As more women, more people from the South, more people of different um, discriminations that have been discriminated in different or left out in different ways, including those that are made vulnerable by conditions such as refugees, etc. Refugees are not people who are born vulnerable, but they are made vulnerable. But I believe that our consciousness of wanting to have more diversity and inclusion is going to make our world better, even though we still have always to struggle to, to, get, um, to get it right. But we do have the resources and we do have the people. You, you, you mentioned it before, you, you're originally from Kenya and you went to an all-girls school there. And you've reflected repeatedly and said repeatedly that it had a positive impact on, on your life and your career. What was, what was it that, that, made it, that made it so life-changing for you, this, this, this education that you got? Maybe you can talk a bit about this. Thank you, Klaus. It was an honor that you researched me. <laughs> but <laughs> um, I do believe that having had that opportunity to go to uh, a girls' school gave me and many other girls 
the opportunity to get the courage and the confidence that sometimes uh, misses out when girls and boys are mixed and where situations actually do not often um, give opportunities to girls to, 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 to believe that they can do anything and they can be anyone. Um, when you are in an all-girls school like I was or the one that I went to, really, we didn't say boys are good at maths and girls are good at, uh, at, at, uh, at, at history. We just said we have maths to do, we have history to do, we have music to do, we have other things to do. So I think that initial early um, putting into my head that um, 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 this, this work to do, and we all have to do it without a competition was a good thing. The second thing I think is that, um, Klaus, if you look throughout the whole world, the people who organize most and do things together are women, whether they are at the village level or at the industry level. If I go into a company, very often I find that there's a group of women who are either senior staff or CEOs or just women. And they say, let's get together and think about something, either do something for themselves or do something for the others. So being in a, a girls' school also gave me that foundation of organizing and uh, supporting one another and whispering it to each other the problems that we might face and sharing what those solutions could be like. And so I learned early the hurdles that women face, but also the solutions that are able to come to the table. And the last one that I want to, um, to, to, to mention is that it has given me a passion for Reva to be a responsible person who advocates on behalf of women. Yes, I'm aware that um, we need a world of women and men, otherwise we are like a bird flying with one wing. That's not what we want. And I do for both, and that's why the word gender justice is important for me. But I'm extremely aware where we have um, uh, the imbalance that women are not always on the same level, and so they need to be brought up on, on the level. So girls' education is important for me. I do a lot of education work. The health of women is important for me. Women in top leadership is important. For me. Women on boards, women CEOs is important for me. I do this work because I know that it's possible and I had that early confidence. You've, you've already transitioned into it. I mean, you've lived in, you come from Kenya, you've lived in, in Switzerland, in Geneva, you're not now living in the US in San Francisco. Um, and the, the problems women face are very different in different parts of the world. Now you've said it's important that they have education, it's important that they get to boardrooms. Do you feel that there is a weight on these different issues where you should, where we should focus more of our energy, getting all women into schools rather than focusing on getting women to boardrooms or should they happen simultaneously? What's your, what's your stance on this? No, Klaus, I beg to differ. The problems that women face are not different in many parts of the world. Women experience them differently because the context shapes those problems. If there's domestic violence, it's domestic violence, it's domestic violence. Whether you're in Switzerland or you're in Papua New Guinea, it's the same thing. Um, a body is being hurt, a mind is being destroyed, etc. But yes, he, but I also hear your question. There's differentials in terms of access to education, which is important and we should never um, lose our eyes and our focus on making sure that there is education for girls elsewhere because there is a big imbalance. Um, but the question of uh, um, having women at the leadership position, which is really what we promote a lot at the uh, Global Compact, um, having women at the tables of decision-making, and which the Secretary General of the United Nations has spoken to, and even he himself has tried to implement, but ensuring that the senior positions at the UN at, during his leadership are being shared by men and women. Now, that is important. Why is that important focus that doesn't meet, matter whether you're in the South or not? Because when women are at the table of the decision-making together with men, they think through where these, um, where there are uh, deficits that must be addressed. And they try to find solutions together. Because having a litany, a big list of things that are going wrong is not enough. But being able to be able to know, and yes, be aware of these create the data, get the resources, change the policies, um, uh, and continue that way, we will impact more people in the world, and we will be able to do a better job of creating a world in which men and women can be able to work together. So I think that um, my view is that uh, we should not make judgment by saying, uh, why have women at the decision-making table when girls in Africa don't go to school, when there's no running water in houses? I think that's a cheap way of uh, 
wanting to escape to face the truth because those girls are going to have water and they are going to go to school when they are good policies. And so we want good decision makers in Africa and elsewhere. And um, I love it when I'm on the table that is an international table. And currently, actually, I live in Nairobi and um, I travel to other places. I used to live in other places and travel everywhere, including to Africa. But now I live in Africa and I just love to be in a place where the center of what needs to happen to change happens because you are a better advocate when you can wake up in the morning and see what it means to her not to have enough girls to school, et cetera. Mosimi, sometimes 50 minutes go by quickly. I have a, a final question for you. You said before that there's different types of role models, different types of definitions of a superwoman for you. Still, as we're trying to tell these inspiring stories to showcase women like you, is there a person, a woman that you've met, that you've worked with in the past that you can single out saying, I look up to them, they're my role model. Um, this is someone who I'd like to follow. Who, who comes to your mind when you hear this question? I must answer your question because you are asking it, but it's such an absurd question for me. I have traveled in 137 countries over the years that I have worked, during which I have met so many people and been influenced in such deep ways. I also grew up in a, a communal where I had my mom, but aunts and grandmothers and everybody. And then I work professionally with women who are uh, superstars, et cetera. And each day I feel that they rub something and leave something on me. And I find it extremely, extremely um, impossible, I, if I say unfair, to be able to just say it's X. And very often my safe place usually is to be able to look at the early upbringing. And the early upbringing really comes with the community of mother and aunts and sisters, et cetera, that pushed and say, you can do it, go that extra step. And so when I have been able to have to answer that question, which by the way is a very Western question, <laughs> I, I often have to be able, I cannot but first honor my mother and the, the family that I grew up with. But professionally, I also work hand in glove with them. Um, famous women such as uh, have worked very closely with Mary Robinson, for example. If I mention a name like that, many people will know that name. I currently work with, the, with, with Sandra or Jumbo in the global um, in the UN Global Compact, and we talk, and she has influence with me. I've worked a lot with the UN Women and worked with Muslim Lamangoka during her time, and she's been a good um, um, a, a also person to think through the bigger systems of the United Nations. So, Klaus, I think your question is fair in that it's a question that people look to. Who is this one single individual? Who is this superwoman who influenced this woman? But because my concept is communal, that many superwomen and supermen influenced me, I, I beg to differ that I don't really want to name one person, but I want to bring and really be grateful to of those women in many countries as well, and villages and in rural communities, because to me it hasn't been those clean boardrooms that have formed me but it has been the gutters of being um, in slums and being in, um, in less, um, uh, less, less um, uh, financial, uh, uh, less up financial situations that really shaped me. And it has shaped me so that I see my place because I can cross both. I could be in the, in the Hilton, let me call it this way, but also I could be very much in um, uh, Islam area and manage both. So I see, I see my role in this um, is the ability to be ambassadorial to both and be able to, to be able to say, we're still all human beings. So let's try and make a life that can be able to support that woman who lives in a, a slum because of her financial uh, needs. And also that woman who is helping us like Marco and, and uh, your um, Marco Angelo by being a president of the country and providing a, a model that we can be able to see that, yes, it can be done. Masimi, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and your experiences with our audience. Um, we, are, we look forward to observing what you do next and, and which nut you will crack next. And all the best to you. And thanks for being a part of this. Thank you very much. And I'd, I'd like to ask you to influence more companies to think of bringing women to the table. That is my mission now, and I hope you can be part of it. We're trying our best with this summit also. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.